Okay, good morning and welcome all to our construction and demolition debris prevention and recycling webinar. We are so happy to have you here today. Thank you for taking the time to talk about an important concept in sustainability. So we hope you are here ready to learn and discuss and engage. Um, I encourage you to keep your microphone muted while the presentation is going, but feel free if you do have a question to unmute your mic and jump in at any time. You can also uh, use the raise hand function that you'll see um, on the bottom right hand of your screen if you have a question, or you can use the chat box as well, which I will initiate right after this and chat me a question and I can read it out um, in case you're in an environment where you can't use your microphone. So those options are all available to you. Um, we have an awesome presenter today who does encourage you to, it's you, it's you, Richard, <laughs> who, who does encourage you to join in discussion and participate. So if you want to throw your camera on and your mic on. We'll make sure that we actually feel like we're here together discussing this topic. Um, so feel free to join. Uh, with that, I won't take up too much more of our wonderful speaker's time, but I do want to introduce Richard Lute. He is a USGBC LA board member. He was on the board for 12 years of the Solid Waste Association of North America. He's also on the board of the Construction and Demolition Recycling Association. So wonderful qualifications to talk to us today. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Richard. Thank you. Good morning, all. Um, everybody wave. Oh, wait, nobody has their cameras on. It's nothing quite as much fun as looking at a sea of black squares. This is going to be fun. Um, hey, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Ryan. <laughs> um, thanks for joining. Um, so originally this, this presentation was going to be given by myself and J. Michael Hulse, uh, who sadly had a conflict and he could not attend. So I'll be giving both sets of slides, which should be interesting because I've never given J. Michael slides before. So uh, if I screw that part up, you know, it's not on me. Um, Yes, I'm not a big fan of actual, you know, uh, accountability. So construction, demolition, recycling. Uh, one of the things that I think it's important to realize is that construction and demolition debris makes up about 30% of all of the waste going into the landfill nationwide. Um, California, we claim a 75% diversion rate for construction, demolition, debris, yet it's still 30% of what's going into our landfill. So that's something from a sustainability point of view, we really have to be aware of, and we have to see what we can do to fix that problem. So we're gonna start off with, uh, with Michael's slides, and Michael is particularly interested in the concrete diversion aspect. Uh, and there's some very important reasons for that. As you can be, see by the slides, there's three tons of concrete made for each one of us around the world every year. It's a lot of concrete. Uh, it, it creates greenhouse gas emissions during the, uh, during the manufacture, during the, the transportation and the use. Uh, and in landfills, it actually, one of the things that's not on these slides, it's actually a huge supplier of acidity into the soil. It, it brings up the pH factor, which is something that is not to be lessened. Um, so with the 140 million tons of concrete recycled annually in the United States, that's a great number. Uh, I think it works out to be pretty close to 70, 80% of the concrete generated in the US. A lot of that has to do with financials. Uh, uh, most of the concrete recycled, because we're always talking a weight-based metric with recycling, it's a lot cheaper to do it on site if you have a big space. If you're doing a, pulling down a building and building a parking lot, you can take the concrete out of the foundation, you can grind it, you can use it as base on site for the new project. So you're not buying new aggregate, you're not transporting off site, you're not transporting on site, it's a great reuse. Um, in 38 states, it can be used for road base or sub base. California is finally one of those states. For a long time, uh, it was kind of ironic that the state of California required the diversion and recycling of concrete, but California DOT would not allow it in road base for public roads, which took out a huge portion of the market for it. Slowly that's changed and we can do that. We're having a similar problem right now with rubberized asphalt. 
Um, it's actually a better product, but it's, there's still plenty of cities that don't want to allow rubberized asphalt because we don't have those years of, of institutional knowledge about how it's going to wear. CalGreen does require a 65% diversion rate for all uh, construction demolition materials generated in the state of California. Uh, for those of you who do not know the way diversion is quantified in construction demolition debris or in anything else, uh, diversion is a weight-based metric. So when they talk about a diversion rate, you're talking about strictly tonnage. So when, when you look at a 65% diversion rate statewide, if you start looking at what is actually being recycled, you're gonna see the concrete recycled to, to a huge extent. It's one of the most recycled commodities. You're gonna see dimensional lumber in the recycling category. Uh, that will go for composting or mulching, that sort of thing. Little known fact, in the state of California, it is illegal to reuse lumber in a structural medium unless that wood has been recertified. To recertify the wood, you have to take it to a specific facility. They have to resurface two sides, so now it's even smaller. Uh, then it has to be recertified. Now it's more expensive than virgin lumber and smaller. So state legislation makes it nearly impossible to reuse that. So while older lumber is actually older growth, stronger, uh, the rings are closer together to more dense material, to better construction material. We don't have access to that. We have to use the new. So all we have available to us for that wood would be composting, mulching, or if you wanted to, you could make furniture or molding or flooring. You could use it for something non-structural, but it's actually a better structural project than the new stuff. As the slide says, about 90% of C&D debris comes from the demolition aspect. Uh, estimators work very hard to make sure they're not bringing additional materials onto the construction site that they're going to pay for and transport and throw away. Uh, drywallers try to keep their waste to five to 10% of what they bring onto the job site. Same thing with the carpet people and whatnot. So, a, a, a huge amount of that diversion has to be has to be done during the demolition phase. Now, for those of you worrying about lead and COVID and diversion and social distancing, uh, the USGBC Los Angeles Construction Committee actually just sent a letter to National about uh, a month ago. And we're trying to figure out how we're going to handle the, the MR credits, MR diversion credits during COVID. Because a lot of facilities have had a difficult time maintaining their diversion rate and doing the social distancing and the other things that are required uh, to stop the spread of COVID. So if any of you have ever been to a recycling facility, they have sort lines and they have people on either side of the line, a conveyor belt pulling off materials to be used. Well, while they're about six feet apart side by side, they're only about four feet apart across the belt. So a lot of these facilities have to work at half capacity to continue that social distancing, uh, which obviously affects their diversion rate. So USGBCLA sent a letter to National, and we have asked that National provide some kind of relief for projects that have counted on those points from the beginning. Because let's face it, we all look at these MR diversion points kind of as a gimme in California. Uh, and to lose those points because of a natural disaster, a, 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 a state of emergency and, a, and a, worldwide pandemic, kind of unfair to the facility. So we're working on that. Um, again, the two most recycled materials by weight are inerts and dimensional lumber. I keep stressing the by weight because that's a huge factor in construction and demolition recycling, and we'll get into that later. The most recycled commodity overall would be metals. Metals are a no-brainer. Steel, copper, aluminum, you're going to get paid for that no matter what. So that is a much higher recycling rate for the commodity, but in a standard, say, commercial interior project, your metals are less than 12% by weight of your project. Whereas a standard demo con, uh, project, if you're doing a full building, you're going to get about 30% of your weight by concrete and about 40% of your weight from dimensional lumber on a wood frame building. 
So we have to keep that by weight paradigm in mind when we start looking at the things that are actually recycled. Michael also put into a slide some of the other things that don't get recycled being universal waste, hazardous waste, uh, drywall plastics, carpet, treated wood, that sort of thing. We'll get more into that when we get into my slides. But those are, those are things to keep in mind. A lot of us only do commercial interior projects. So in a commercial interior projects, less than 10% of your, your weight is going to come from inert being the concrete. And, and in most of those projects, it's going to be uh, granite flooring, ceramic tile, granite countertops, that kind of stuff. Um, and almost zero dimensional lumber. In a commercial interior project, all we use is manufactured wood, particle board, plywood, that sort of stuff that can't be mulched and composted. It can't be land applied because of the concentration of chemicals in the manufacturing of those projects. Um, do we have any questions so far? Come on, guys, I'm not that We good. actually have, we have one question. Sorry, I was muted because of traffic. <laughs> All right. Adam asks, why do you think that lead as part of the CWM credit continues to leave in, vol in volume as an option for construction waste diversion? The reason we uh, continue to use volume is because lead being a national or international program, there are plenty of places who, uh, plenty of facilities who are still calculating their weight by volume. If you don't have a scale on site, if you're doing it by cubic yards in, cubic yards out, volume's the only option you have. So I'm not a big fan. I like the weight aspect. Uh, I don't think it's the best, but it's the best of those two options. But again, when Calgreen went from 50% diversion to 65% diversion, they actually reached out to us to work with them on the new diversion rate. And I personally was pushing very heavily for 75% diversion statewide for CND debris. But in working on that, I started to realize that there are places like San Bernardino County and Riverside County and, and up north that simply don't have the same infrastructure that we have. And if you're gonna do a statewide or a national standard, it needs to be something that everybody can obtain. And that weight-based paradigm doesn't necessarily fall into that. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, so this is one of Michael's slides that I am not as familiar with because the greening of the concrete, I know that there are, there are uh, programs to find concrete that is, uh, that is carbon capture and we have permeable concrete and we have some other stuff. Um, at the end of this presentation, Michael's information is, is on the slide. If this is something you need more information about, uh, he loves to talk about it and he knows far more than I do. Um, we do need to remove, reduce the amount of waste, not just concrete, but all materials on construction sites, uh, and look at the way that we deal with it. Right now, concrete waste, you have a, a waste washout that's very water intensive, uh, along with other things. I don't know what the better way to go is, but they use an inordinate amount of water with the waste concrete on site and washing it out. It takes up a lot of space waiting for that water to evaporate to get out or you're trucking the heavy water. There are a lot of issues. And that's the end of Michael's slides. Any more questions while we watch these lovely towers fall? Not on the chat, but again, anyone that has questions, feel free to unmute yourself and jump in and ask if you'd like to. Please. It makes me know that people are actually listening and it's just not squares. So now we go into what I think is the more important aspect of what's going on, and that's the toxicity of construction demolition debris. What's up, Adam? Thank you very much. Um, so again, CND is a weight-based paradigm. CND being construction demolition because I'm lazy. Uh, um, so the way that they get this diversion, I don't know how many people here have been to a construction demolition recycling facility or any recycling facility or even a landfill. But all of these places work exactly the same way. You have 100, 200, 1,000 trucks a day coming in and dumping into one 
main pile. And once your project debris comes in and gets dumped into this grand pile waiting for diversion, there is no way at all to track the diversion for your project. It can't be done. Uh, on a lead 95% job, if you're going for that innovation point, the only way to really get that point is if that facility takes your debris in separately, dumps it in a completely separate part of their facility, weighs it separate from everything else, sorts it separately from everything else, and then weighs the individual commodities outbound to prove that 95%. To do that on a project by project basis is not only exorbitantly expensive, but it takes up far too much room in any facility to have a hundred piles of debris waiting to be sorted. So what they do is they take your inbound weight, again, a weight-based metric, for a period of time, a day, a month, a quarter. And they take your inbound tonnage and they subtract what you send to the landfill. So inbound minus landfill equals diversion. In round numbers, you bring in 100 tons a day, you send 70, 25 tons a day to the landfill, you have a 75% diversion rate. Ooh, look, my dog wants to play. Um, and that's great for an overall metric, an overall concept of what that diversion is. But what it does is it hides what's actually being diverted. That gives you a weight, but not a material. And these facilities are not required to report by material what is being recycled, it's strictly weight. So the things again that are not being shown in this facility average, the things that are traditionally sent to the landfill are the gypsum, uh, the manufactured lumber, that being particle board, plywood, that stuff. Not engineered, not, um, not treated lumber. Treated lumber, we all know the brown or the green stuff, that is a straight up hazardous waste. That is never supposed to go to a recycling facility or to the landfill. That has to go to a hazardous waste facility. Uh, also carpet and universal waste. So those things are all kind of getting hidden in this equation. Um, and that, that makes a huge difference because now you can hide what you're recycling. If you think about what we had talked about in some of the earlier slides, about 40% of a wood framed structure's weight is coming from dimensional lumber. About 30% is coming from the concrete foundation or footings. So that's 70% on two commodities that needs to be recycled. With a 65% diversion rate for the state of California, you recycle those two things and you're done. The issue with that is, as I said earlier, weight based is better than volume based for diversion. My personal belief is we need to switch to a toxicity based diversion paradigm. Because by recycling the wood and recycling the concrete or even diverting rather than recycling they're different things. We're allowing the lightweight more toxic materials to go to the landfill with zero accountability. And we can go into that a little more in, in detail. Uh, we will go into that more in detail. But that's the issue with the, the strictly weight-based metric, is now we're looking at how much did you recycle, or how much did what you recycle weigh, not what did you recycle. One of the biggest issues with this is that at the end of the day, everything we don't recycle goes to a landfill. And these landfills will leak. Each and every one of them, regardless of what you're being told, these landfills will leak. The liners in landfills are made of HDPE plastic. It's great plastic. It's a very thick plastic. Uh, and it has a 50 year warranty on it if you're lucky. 50 years is a very important number when it comes to that. Now I said in the, in the, uh, the little bird before this, we talked about some of the greenwashing that's going on. And this is part of that. It's not just in the diversion. It's also in the disposal. When you own a landfill, on average, it takes you, give or take about 20 years to fill that landfill. And then once that landfill is full, the company that, that, uh, that owns it is required for something called a post-closure activity. Now, normally during that time of post-closure, what these people are doing is they're bringing dirt over the top and they're planning a nice park or a golf course and they're monitoring the methane and they're doing all of these things. 
Um, and then at the end of the post-closure activity, it is not uncommon for these companies to gift this property to the state or to the county. Here, have a nice park, have a nice golf course. Who here wants to guess how long these companies are legally responsible for the landfill during post-closure? Anybody? How long? No, no, there's a 50-year <laughs> guarantee on the liner and it takes 20 years to fill the landfill. How long 30. are they legally resp responsible? Is it 30 years? 30 years. Yeah. Which means that the moment they grant that land to the state of the county, they're no longer legally responsible for it. And if it leaks, it's our problem. This is a problem. Nobody wants to talk about that. And nobody wants to talk about the things that can cause trouble with the landfill liners. Things like peppermint oil or alcohol or nail polish remover. All of the things that go into the trash every day and make it to the landfill. Uh, because California is a seismically active activity makes it even worse because what these what these chemicals do to the plastic is it makes it brittle and so any seismic activity any motion once it's brittle now you have holes in the landfill liner and all of that leachate all of that lovely ugly chemical concoction that is leached out of every material put into the landfill during that time now leaks down into the ground this is a problem. So now we start going into individual materials. So gypsum. In a commercial interior project, gypsum makes up about 30% of the, of the weight of that entire project. It is the single heaviest commodity to be found in a commercial interior project. Uh, the reason now that I'm concentrating mostly on commercial interior projects, that is the bulk of the demolition work done in Los Angeles. Not a lot of buildings coming down when compared to the sheer amount of tenant space being done. So this is where the, the weight versus toxicity comes in handy because again, less than 10% of this weight is inert. Less than 1% of it is, is dimensional lumber. So if you are taking commodity, a, a load to a recycling facility that gets 70% of their diversion from two commodities, and you don't have either of those commodities in your load, what's being recycled? So gypsum uh, is a naturally occurring mineral, mineral. It was known in the past as alabaster. So alabaster statues are actually made out of gypsum. Uh, it's a beautiful building material. Gypsum is about 28% water, which is why it has the fire rating that it does. Uh, when you have drywall up in a project, and there's a fire on one side of the wall, the back of the wall never gets hotter than the boiling point of water until the water has evaporated from the gypsum, which is why you have a one hour rating or a two hour rating. It's how long it takes that water to evaporate. Stupid little facts like this are what make me happy. So I apologize. <laughs> um, so again, naturally occurring mineral in the built-out safe, it's perfectly safe. Uh, there's some dust issues during, uh, during construction and whatnot, but what isn't there. But when the space is built, it's perfectly safe. The issue with, with gypsum comes when it comes out of the project and it goes into a landfill. A landfill is an anaerobic environment. There is no oxygen within the landfill. When gypsum de decomposes anaerobically, checking my time, uh, it creates hydrogen sulfide gas which is a nasty, corrosive, toxic gas, smells like rotten eggs. And four pounds of gypsum will create one pound of hydrogen sulfide gas. So it's a lot. Um, to put it into perspective, you, the average floor plate of a high-rise building in downtown LA is give or take 20,000 square feet. And we take about 24 tons of gypsum out of one floor plate. So that's about six tons of hydrogen sulfide gas being produced in the landfill if that gypsum makes it to the landfill. Now, hydrogen sulfide is a heavier than air gas, so we don't really have to worry about it escaping from the soil. But the problem with the hydrogen sulfide, because it's so heavy uh, and so caustic, it gets into the methane collection system that every landfill has to have. 
And this hydrogen sulfide can actually eat away at the pipes and the turbines uh, and can eventually eat holes in these pipes that will allow the methane to vent. So while it is not in and of itself a, a greenhouse gas, it can contribute to the release of greenhouse gases. Now, if you take that same gypsum and you don't put it in a landfill and you land apply it, it does amazing things. The soil in California is very clay rich. I don't know how many of you have ever tried to water your yard and just seen the water flow over the top and not want to infiltrate. And you try to dig and it's very difficult. A lot of that is the clay. So when you mix, mix gypsum with the soil, you break that clay up and it increases uh, water infiltration, nut nutrient infiltration, it improves root growth, makes it easier for the worms to get through. It does a lot of really positive things, um, but it has to get to the soil first. So this is why I start saying we need to, we need to prioritize toxicity over weight when we start looking at diversion. We ship, on our best months, we ship about 1,200 tons of gypsum to one farmer and he puts it on his crops uh, and absolutely loves it and would take as much as more as we could give him. So if you put that in perspective, every month that's 1200 tons of virgin gypsum we don't need to pull out of the mines for agricultural purposes. That's 1200 tons of landfill space that is not being used for gypsum that could be used for something else and more importantly, that is 300 tons of hydrogen sulfide gas not produced. But because we're still going with this weight-based metric and gypsum is a much lower percentage nationwide or statewide and nationwide over these other materials, we're not concentrating on that. Adam, question? Yeah, I got a question. Um, are they using gypsum as ADC? But that still seems like a waste, even if they are. Uh, so they don't want it as ADC because that keeps it much closer to the surface, the landfill, and the landfill really doesn't want that, that rotten egg smell. Uh, okay, so the farmers deal with that. Yeah, well, the farmers, so here's the thing. With the farmers, it's being uh, tilled in with the soil and oxygen can get to the gypsum, so it's not in an anaerobic environment. So it's not producing that hydrogen sulfide gas. It's just when you put it in that landfill and you cap it and you keep the oxygen away from it that we have the hydrogen sulfide problem. So. Got it, thank you. Of course. Now we get to manufactured or engineered lumber. Believe it or not, this is the most toxic stuff that I deal with as a demo contractor that is not considered a hazardous waste. If you want to think, and this is what everything in a high rise is made of, from the cabinets to the desks to the chairs to the doors, it's all manufactured lumber. Manufactured lumber, regardless of what it is, has a similar chemical makeup. You have uh, pesticides, so the bugs won't eat. You've got fungicides, so mold won't grow. You have a fire retardant, so it won't burn. You have formaldehyde, so it won't rot. Uh, you have some sort of adhesive to hold it together. And then on a finished piece like a desk or a door, you have a stain and a varnish on a very pretty top coat. And in a kitchen cabinet or something else, something along those lines, we glue a piece of plastic to the outside so it wears better. Again, in the built environment, it's perfectly safe. It has done all of the off-gassing that it needs to do. Uh, so it's not going to cause any issues. But once it comes out in a demo, if it makes it to the landfill, again, the, uh, that leachate at the bottom of the landfill we talked about, every time it rains and the water percolates down through these materials, it takes these chemicals down to the bottom. And eventually the landfill leaks and eventually these chemicals get into the groundwater. Now, sadly, the best option we have for manufactured lumber in California, and I'm gonna catch static for saying this, but it's fact, is waste energy. It is not my favorite thing, but it's almost the only outlet we have for this. Nobody is taking this and making new manufactured lumber out of it because you can no longer verify what the chemical makeup is of the final product. You don't know exactly what's going into it. Um, waste energy is actually not a bad use for that as long as they're using new technologies. 
new technologies for waste to energy. And again, this is just my own personal opinion. This is not USGBC. This is not anybody else. This is somebody in the field every day. New waste energy facilities are what we call in vessel. What they do is they take the waste, no matter what it is, and they put it in a sealed vessel and pump out all of the oxygen. Then they heat that vessel to 12 to 1800 degrees and everything inside chars. It never actually combusts because there's no oxygen, it chars. And it creates within the vessel something called a syngas. And what they do is they siphon that syngas out of this sealed vessel, put it through filters, put it through a cleaning process, and you get the equivalent of a natural gas on the back end. Kind of expensive, but right now, the only options we have are to either do that process or to put it in a landfill. There's a third option for a very small percentage of this, which is donation. Uh, and we'll talk about that later. We have a huge warehouse where we donate materials that are still good. And that's always the best option. But we can't find enough people to take the stuff that we pull out. So we have to find another way to deal with it. Ideally, there are some, some really cool technologies coming out to deal with manufactured lumber. Uh, there's one lady who has a fascinating system where she's using mushrooms. And these mushrooms, they, they shred the manufactured lumber and keep it wet. And these mushrooms actually go in and eat the toxins. It's fascinating. It's not fast, but it's fascinating. And it's a very environmentally friendly way to do it, but that's still really new. So we're, we're still kind of seeing what's going on. Uh, another thing in the high rise building, this is three to 6% of the weight of a project is acoustic ceiling tiles. Now this one makes me angry. This one physically makes me angry. Acoustic ceiling tiles, as long as they are not foil backed or vinyl faced are 100% recycled. Armstrong ceiling will take them back for free and they will make brand new tiles out of these things. About seven years ago, we became a consolidation center for Armstrong ceiling. We were at the time the largest recycler of ceiling tiles in the Western United States and we wanted to do more. So we signed a deal with Armstrong that said, anybody else that wants to bring a ceiling tile, we'd be happy to take it and ship it in. Because the, the only problem with their system is you need 30,000 square feet of tile palletized and stacked before they'll send a truck to pick it up. Most people don't have that kind of room. So we said, fine, if they have five, 10 pallets, whatever, bring it here, we'll hold it until we have a truck load. In the seven years that we have been the only consolidation center in a 50 mile radius of the city of Los Angeles, we have not received one single tile from any other contractor, not one. If you look at the details of, of what you can save from recycling the tiles, and that's on, this, on the uh, screen. During the drought, I took this to the state of California and I said, look, we can save almost a gallon of water per pound by recycling ceiling tile. And I was told by the state, I kid you not, the factory where they're doing this is in Oregon. It's not California water we're saving. Makes me mad. So as a community, to have this outlet for this material and to have not have it taken advantage of fully by the community, that makes me angry. So Richard, why do you think that is? Do you think it's just an awareness issue or why would you not be receiving the it's, tile when that's such a good opportunity? It's partly awareness. Here's the thing, it's a little more expensive. Instead of just taking it down and throwing it in the trash, you have to stack it, palletize it, and shrink wrap it. And then you have to move it a couple of times. But here's the thing, if the architect spec'd ceiling tile diversion in the plans, they'd have to do it. If the lead consultant pushed it to their client as a slightly more expensive, but not that more expensive plan, they would do it. But I spoke at Green Build in Chicago, first time it was Chicago, 11 years ago, something like that. And there was a guy running around Green Build that I loved and he was handing out badges that said, when did the points become the point? And I think we're still seeing some of that because people want the points, but they, we've all seen it. They want the easiest, most convenient way to get to those points. And if it's a couple of bucks more or a little more time, nobody seems to want to play that game. And it becomes frustrating, especially in a situation like this, 
where there is a ready-made solution for a waste stream that has a gigantic impact on the environment. So I think some of it might be awareness. I try to tell myself that so it's a little easier to sleep at night, but Armstrong's had this program in place for 15 years. Adam? Yeah, but how much, how much of that program is actually used, I'm wondering now, after listening to you, sounds like they probably set up a program with some thresholds that are not really achievable by anyone in terms of them picking up the tiles. Well, a lot of it has to be, I mean, they, they've got a business to run and they can't send a truck out for six pallets. Right. It just doesn't make sense. They have to have some kind of threshold. Generally, the way it works, because the plant is in Oregon, is when they send a truckload of brand new tile down to LA to be dropped off to the distributors, that same truck swings by the recycling facility and picks up those pallets and takes it back to the factory. So they want to fill the truck and that makes a certain amount of sense. Are you aware of other facilities around the country that do what you do with the ACT? Uh, so there's a couple of places that are working on it. Um, I know that it's a very successful program back east. They're doing pretty well with it. Uh, up, uh, up north Washington, they're doing, no, granted, that's closer to the facility. Right. But I know it is a, a much more successful program in other parts of the country. Okay. So. Carpet recycling. This is another fun one. Do, have I lost anybody? Any more questions? Is everybody still having fun? Okay, that's one. I'll take it. Um, so when we start looking at carpet recycling, we, um, we've all dealt with the carpet companies who tell us how green they are. We've all heard from the carpet companies how much they recycle and how much recycled content is in their carpet. And that's always been true, but it hasn't always been the real story. Now, before I continue this story, let me put it, let me point out that we now have CARE, which is Carpet Amer America Recovery Effort, which is a state program, much like the bottle buyback program. Now, when you buy carpet, you're paying 25 cents a yard uh, up front towards the recycling, and that money goes to the recycler on the back end. And the state of California and the carpet industry is working much harder now to actually recycle their carpet, which is a great thing. Historically though, like I said, they would brag about the recycled content and how much they recycle. What they wouldn't tell you is that what they were recycling was almost exclusively residential carpet. And there's a reason for that. When we buy a house, most of us own that house for decades and they wanna sell us carpet more than once. So residential carpet was designed to have a very thin backing and a nice thick nap and felt great between your toes when you walked on it. But after three or four years, the heavy traffic area started to show. And after five or six years, little tufts would start coming out. And eventually you bought new carpet. By comparison, the average tenant in a commercial high rise moves every five to seven years. Once the furniture is depreciated and the, the office is starting to look a little worn rather than put their their clients and their staff through a rebuild on site. They rent another space, they furnish it, they move into it. And all of this five to seven year old stuff is now trash. So the carpet company said, okay, well, if that's the way you're gonna do it, then our carpet and our commercial carpet needs to look as good the day they move out as it did the day they moved in so that we can get their business again. So the backing on commercial carpet was made very, very thick and the nap was very thin and it was designed to never fall apart so it would continue to look good. Well, that very design made it almost impossible to recycle. So again, the greenwashing. Now, again, the carpet companies now are doing a significantly better job. But I think it's important to look at historically what was happening so we can take that knowledge and try to apply it to some of the products today that are touting amazing results, but maybe not telling the entire story. Um, fluorescent lamps. Now let's be honest, how many people are still throwing these in the trash at home? I don't see any hands going up and I, I can't blame you. It's been illegal to throw fluorescent tubes in the trash since 2006. 
for a long time, fluorescent tubes was one of the leading causes uh, for mercury in the groundwater in the state of California. In a commercial building in a standard high-rise downtown LA, you have between three and 500 fluorescent tubes per floor for a standard building. Um, and for a long, long time, we were fighting the industry because it is not uncommon to watch a fluorescent light fixture get thrown into a dumpster, tubes and all, and once those tubes break, they're gone. You can't even really see they were there. Now, I don't want to say people were doing this intentionally, so I won't, but the law was fairly well known. And we, we push back against this. And when I say we, I mean uh, CDRA, Construction Demolition Recycling Association, and some of the other recyclers. And we said, look, by not enforcing this law, you are actually putting lives at risk for the people who work at recycling facilities. Because by not actually tracking this waste, we made it illegal to throw it away, but there was no tracking uh, element in this. So this mercury in, in uh, impregnated silica dust that's in these light fixtures is so fine that a standard mask barely even slows it down. So suddenly you have people working on those sorting lines that we were talking about earlier, standing six feet apart, sorting through the trash. And because they don't know that they're broken fluorescent tubes in this trash, every time they lift something, they're releasing this dust that is going straight through their mask and putting mercury directly into their lungs. And I contacted the, the state of California and some of the legislators and I said, what are we gonna do about this? And the guy said, well, what do you want us to do? We already made it illegal. So we decided we needed some kind of, of tracking for that, which is where uh, one of the newer building codes came into effect. And I think this is something um, something that's good for everybody to know. January 1st, 2017, uh, it became state law, went into the build, building code that now you have to track your universal waste on any construction demolition project. And what you're supposed to do is up front, you have to identify the waste. Now it was written this way, kind of to give architects additional work because on the plans they can go out and they have to identify the universal waste in the space before it demos and you turn that in with your building permit. And at the back end of the permit, you have to show proper diversion of these toxic materials, or you're not supposed to get final sign off on your project. Now this has been building code for three years. And earlier this year, two cities have actually enacted tracking of these materials. It's a slow rollout, but I think it's important for us as environmental professionals to know about this so we can keep our jobs on track because we don't know how people are gonna start looking at this retroactively. This is an important thing to keep in mind. What else can we done, be done? I talked about uh, donation earlier. I think, now IRS demo, and this is not a commercial for us, we are the unicorn. There are not any other companies I know of that are doing the demo and the recycling and the hauling all at once. So they can't do what we do. But that doesn't mean it can't be done in another way. Uh, if you are in a community, it's not that hard to reach out to nonprofits in your community before you do a demo and say, look, we have this furniture left in our space. Does anybody want it? And if you can get the nonprofits to come in and get it, now you're not paying to move it. You're actually going to save money on your space. Plus, you're getting these materials back into the neighborhood. You're helping nonprofits. You're lessening the waste flow, and you're keeping toxics out of the landfill. And there are plenty of ways to do this. Yeah, it's a little more work up front, but the environmental benefits to doing it this way are undeniable. So I urge you guys, when you start doing your charrettes, if you're looking at lead projects, let's look at reuse options for these materials. Let's look at, you know, if you're, do, if you're doing a, a restaurant and it's older material and you're gonna demo it to put it in a new restaurant, let's look at the local food kitchens and see what of that material, that equipment they can use. You know, instead of going to a uh, liquidator who's going to give you five cents on the dollar for it, is it worth that when you could be feeding the community with it? These are questions that I think we need to ask if we start looking at that triple bottom line and not just 
the money on the back end. Whoops. Deconstruction, I know we're running out of town time because I talk a lot. So I'm gonna go through these quickly. Deconstruction is a huge uh, hot button issue right now. A lot of people talk about deconstruction and how awesome it is. Um, deconstruction works really well in some parts of the country. California is not one of them. The commercial interior space is not a good space for deconstruction. Um, deconstruction relies on the fact that you're gonna be able to sell some of the materials you take out of this project to make up for the cost of taking it apart slowly. Most California houses or tract homes or were built in the 50s, 60s, maybe 70s. Uh, and the question I always ask people when they look at this, if they think that their house is, is a viable outlet for deconstruction, I say, would you buy anything that came out of your house? Would you buy your drawer pulls? Would you buy your windows? Would you buy the, the, the fiberglass tub that's coming out of there? No. Now, if you had a 200 year old house with clawfoot tubs and the antique drawer pulls and leaded glass windows, those have, those have a value to them. But most of what we have here in California and deconstruction is primarily a residential thing. It just doesn't make sense. Plus there's the cost involved. We actually did a deconstruction of Ed Begley Jr.'s house. He bought a new house and he wanted to go lead platinum. And it turns out the, the, there were mold issues and the house had to come down. So we went in uh, for free because we're not that bright. And um, it took us a standard demo for a house. You got the guy on the backhoe, you got the guy with the bobcat, and you got the guy who drives the truck who, who runs the hose also and keeps the dust down. They're gonna get the house down in two or three days. It's gonna cost you 10 grand. Ed Begley Jr.'s house cost, we had, uh, we, we kind of flipped what this chart shows. We had 20 guys for seven days, and it cost us almost $20,000 to take that house apart piece by piece. So there's always gonna be questions about deconstruction, and we put these slides in just to kind of educate you. It's a great concept for a very specific kind of project, but there's not a lot of them that are gonna fall into that. Um, so when we start talking about greening construction, this is when I start talking about, let me just see where we're going. This is where we start talking about your job. If you're an engineer, if you're an architect, if you're a lead consultant, we need to look at these things up front. I always tell architects, you have more power than you think. If you spec carpet diversion, they have to do it. If you spec drywall diversion, they have to do it. Talk to your client, see if it's worth it for them. If it is, spec it. Once it's spec'd, Make sure it's on the demo sheet. Make sure it's on the flooring sheet. Make sure it's on the ceiling sheet. Because if you just put it in the general conditions, nobody's going to read it. But if you want to recycle drywall, you put it on the wall detail, you put it on the demo sheet. That way everybody sees it and they have to do it. We also need to look at the materials that we're choosing. My mom was in construction management forever and she used to love to tell the story of the architect who had been to Italy and found this amazing floor finish. It was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. And he tried to spec it in one of her buildings and she looked at the sheet and one of the things it said is never put water on this finish. Looked great. How's janitory gonna take care of it? So sometimes all of us get caught up in the pretty and get away from the day to day and the usefulness. And I think it's our job as, as, as green building connoisseurs, for want of a better word, to be aware of the entire life cycle of all of these things that we're specking. You know, it may be green up front, but what's happening on the back end? Let's look at the full life cycle and analysis of these materials. Um, so California has zero waste goals, the state of uh, the state. The county has a zero waste plan, the city has a zero waste plan, and they all have different timelines. Is zero waste going to happen? I don't know. I think it's a wonderful concept. I think it's something we all have to work towards. Are these dates, are these deadlines realistic? We're gonna have to see what we can work for. Uh, the only thing I know for sure is if we don't start working for them now, we're never gonna. And that's all I got. Do we have any questions?
We do. Yay! So, Sarah wants to know, um, do you have any resources to show the incremental cost for specifying better diversion just so we're prepared? So you're going to get, this irritates me, you're going to get 75% almost no matter where you go. Whether they get it or not, whether it's your material or not, they're going to have that facility average of 75%. There are bad actors out there. There are good actors out there. There are some really good processors in Los Angeles. Um, but there's one who I won't mention where if you call them up and ask them what their diversion rate is, they'll ask you what city you're working with. Well, that shouldn't matter. You only have one diversion rate, no matter where the material is coming from. But they ask you what city they're coming in, you're coming from, so they'll make sure to give you the number that coincides with that city. That is a definite red flag. Uh, the only addition for diversion, if you're looking for a lead 95% or better, if you're trying to get the innovation point, that adds about 20% to the cost of the demo for us. I can't speak for other facilities. Um, but because of the additional handling, it adds about 20% to the cost of the demo. I would also caution you to be a little skeptical of any place that guarantees you 95% diversion. You know, I know we can do it, but I won't guarantee it because I have absolutely no guarantee that you're not going to have uh, a building engineer who decides he wants all of the copper and aluminum off of the job, which is fine. It's going to get recycled, but it doesn't come across my scale. I can't count for it. And if I don't count for it, that's diversion that's going to go against that 95%. So even though I know I can do it, we won't guarantee it up front because anything could happen. You could have a load of drywall and suddenly somebody's not thinking and they throw a lunch bag in there with a half empty cup of soup. My drywall recycler won't take that load because it's contaminated. So there's nine tons of drywall I can't recycle that's going to go against it. Can't make that guarantee. So anybody that promises you 95% up front, I guarantee you they'll give you certification. They'll give you paperwork that shows 95%. I don't know that they're going to be able to put on that. Do you have um, that incremental cost for the Armstrong tiles for that recycling specifically? Um, you know, it's been a while since we've looked at it. Again, I, I, this isn't a commercial for us. We, I just happen to work for IRS. I know what it costs us. I can't say what it costs anybody else. I don't know what their, what their protocol is for taking out ceiling tiling, what their standard rate is. So I couldn't tell you what the up is. It's, it shouldn't be that much. It really shouldn't. In the grand scheme of things, if it's more than five cents a square foot, I think maybe you've done something wrong. But I, again, that's, I can't swear to that. We have another question from Ryan. Um, has the state considered breaking out C&D diversion goals to consider them separately from traditional recycling goals? Uh, so they do, actually. The, the state mandate for C&D recycling is 65%. Uh, you're lucky if you go municipal solid waste, MSW, you're really lucky to get 50% diversion on that. It was a complete and total different goal because the, the materials are so, so disparate that you're just not going to, to have an equal uh, diversion rate across the entire spectrum. Okay. Questions, anyone else? And you can hey Richard, I had two questions. The first question I had for uh was about the sheetrock uh gypsum board that you were talking about um when you go to demo it and uh the gypsum board has paint on one side how are they able to take that that paint off for the farmers so the guy that we ship it to has paid a lot of money to chemists and scientists uh, we're lucky pretty much every project we work on is in a lead building Every space we work in has been remodeled in the last five to seven years, give or take. So they're all using new paint, which is low or no VOC, that becomes pretty much chemically inert by right. the time it, it gets to us. The other thing is you're talking such a small amount of parts per million that you look at it, you've got five-eighths of gypsum 
an eighth of paper, and then three sixty fourths of an inch of paint. So the amount is so low, they don't worry about it. Uh, they don't take the paper off because the paper is strictly compostable. It just adds carbon to the soil. Okay, cool. That's uh, really good information. Thanks. And then the second question I had was, um, uh, I just started, it's just random that this presentation came up and I started looking into solid waste for general contractors. And, and you're right. I feel that, um, like I've started talking to some of my superintendents about it and, and they just already go to the, you know, to the hauling report that says, 50, you know, generally 50% gets recycled here and there. Um, but, you know, I, I, I wonder what, when you talk about the specs for designers and engineers to be written from a GC standpoint, where do you think we could be um, I specifically am just looking at solid waste because I see that as the largest volume that we contribute in construction, um, you know, compared to like energy usage or water waste. But where, where in, um, for a GC, what would you recommend? Like what would be some probably maybe low hanging fruit or even big hanging fruit, um, high hanging fruit that we could uh, start um, addressing? Where would you think we should go for that. As a GC, your best bet is to talk to your hauler. Have a long, in-depth conversation with your hauler. The first thing you do is you have to, um, hey, you stole my screen. You have to, um, you have to understand what, what can be recycled and what can't. You have to understand the trash. Then you have to talk to your hauler and you have to ask them, okay, you're just the hauler. You're not the recycler. Where are you taking my material? Once you find out where they're taking it, you have to look into their diversion. Make sure your hauler knows what your diversion rates are and what your reporting requirements are and hold their feet to the fire. You know, target the materials you want. See if you can actually get your hauler to accept store separated materials. If you're doing a ground up and you have room on your space for multiple bins, then you can have a dumpster for drywall and a dumpster for concrete and a dumpster for metals. And if you source separate version is gonna be higher and your dumpsters are gonna go cheaper because a, 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 a dumpster filled with one material, if they don't have to sort it, they're gonna charge you less to haul. So basically you need to do what you're doing right now, which is to educate yourself. And then you need to have that in-depth conversation with your own. Okay, so like if we uh, have an upcoming project, and fortunately I, I work on, I touch every project in our LA region, watch what they have for demo, and then see, talk to the demo sub, and then talk to the hauler that they have um, on, on board and see what we could do from that standpoint. Well, I'll tell you what, if you wanted to give me a call offline, uh, I would be more than happy to tell you what you can expect from any kind of demo. And you can put together a little sheet. And then all you have to do is worry about talking to your hauler, find out where they're taking it, find out what their diversion rate is, find out what they're, what clean materials they're exporting from site. Because I uh -huh. promise you, if your recycling facility does not show truckloads of just carpet leaving the site, they're not recycling carpet. If they don't show truckloads of just gypsum leaving the site, they're not recycling carpet. It's the easiest way to do it. Interesting. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you. No problem. Awesome. Thank you so much, Richard. That was a very informative. I learned a ton and I hope everyone else did too. Uh, thank you all for joining. Just so you know, uh, we have recorded the webinar. That recording will be available if you would like to rewatch or share with anyone on your team. Uh, we generally send web um, recaps of all of our monthly webinars at the end of the month. So look out for that. Or you and I want to let you know about some of the other education and training that we have coming up through USGBC LA. If you enjoyed this content, I'm sure you'll enjoy, enjoy some others. So here's what we have for June and July, and you can check it out via our talent portal, which is pretty new to our site. Um, this is how you access the talent portal. Uh, it has uh, green jobs, education and training, all that good stuff. So we encourage you to get involved there.
And then if you're looking for more, you can also join a committee for USGBCLA. I know Richard mentioned the construction committee, but we really have them on various focuses. So you can really drill into what interests you the most and really be part of the solution and connect the dots that Richard was talking about between all these different programs and them actually being utilized throughout um, particular our city, but our full region. So I encourage you to do that. And then another way you can get involved is with the Municipal Green building conference and expo we will be talking about construction and demolition waste and recycling and so much more it will now be a fully virtual conference it will not be unfortunately at LATTC and DTLA because we all know that we're not really getting together so much in person these days but we have a lot of excellent content so please join us for that um, and then if you like this content it is mostly free so please donate so that we can keep uh, getting this done. We are a small nonprofit team, so we appreciate all your support so that we can do as much as we can right now for you. And also our sponsors make that possible. So thank you so much to them for continuing to bring this great content forward. And thank you to you for being a part of it because really we can only um, make LA a more sustainable city together. So keep doing your part. We will keep doing ours. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're here if you need anything. Thank you, Richard, so much. And um, hopefully we will all see each other soon. Thank you. Thank you all for putting up with me for an hour. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Richard. Have a good day.